one week season. One week season, fam, La Familia. Welcome back. Week 14, FanDuel DFS Labs episode. I am Mike Johnson, your host, M Johnson 86. As I am known in the DFS and the best ball streets, we're getting close to the end of the best ball season. Uh, things are heating up there last week of the regular season, heading into the playoffs for DraftKings and Underdog. Drafters coming down to the end. I've got a couple sweats there. Uh, so, yeah. Fun time of year as things heat up. If you're in fantasy leagues, regular fantasy leagues, getting ready for the playoffs uh, next week as well, hoping to sneak in. Um, really exciting slate this week. We've got 11 games, one extra game uh, than what we've had the last few weeks. Uh, we have, once again, a really uh, exciting, potentially high-scoring game uh, in the late window as a hammer with Buffalo and Kansas City. We have the San Francisco 49ers um, just steamrolling everybody. Uh, the Brock Purdy MVP train is full speed ahead at this point. They're you know dropping 30 plus points a game, and there's lots of arguments on Twitter, uh, you know, about if Purdy deserves MVP. It's just you know things are getting wild in the NFL. Uh, it's good because there's also been a lot of really ugly football across the league. Uh, so it's good that we're having some uh, different areas that we can be excited about, um, including one specific, surprisingly exciting uh, tidbit that we're going to get into when we dive into my esteemed colleague Max's lineup this week. Um, kind of a surprise superstar was born on Monday night. So with that being said, you know him, you love him, Maximus. Welcome back. Hello, Mike. Hello, all. Where How are we doing get, today? Where can I get your shirt? Ooh. All right. You'll have to send me your address when we get off and, uh, you know, I can send it out. We've actually talked about trying to do like a store or something. I have a buddy that uh, he does screen printing. He has like a, a business. And so when I joined on with OWS two and a half years ago, um, yeah, I was like kind of pumped about it. So I uh, had him print off a bunch of them. And I actually recently uh, sent some out. I had a bunch still left here. So I sent some out to Aaron, JM, Hilo, Zandamir. Um, so yeah, you have to hit me up with address and size and I'll, I'll get something out to you. Represent. Yeah. I will do that. So Got a brand. I, New things about branding, 2023. Yeah. Hashtag branding. Branding and hashtags. Hashtags of brands and IG and FB. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm praying to the universe, to the gods, please give me a week that is in-game injury free. We'll see if week 14 I can break the curse in my play. I've had five weeks in a row in player injuries on my main teams that have just derailed what otherwise would have been. What could have, could have, what it could have showed up, but it's unfortunately part of the game, guys. It sucks. It's brutal when it happens consecutive weeks. In my case, a streak of five. So I'm hoping week 14 uh, players can sit, players can stay upright and we can get through games here. So you guys heard it here first. Uh, check out Maximus's lineup today. Uh, and know that at least one of those guys is going down on Sunday. Um, yeah, I, I kid. It, 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 it's funny, though, how that works. Like, it feels like those things come in bunches where like, cause I've had streaks like that too, but then I've also had times where, and it's not even necessarily like I was on a hot streak winning every week, but I'm like, yeah, I haven't really been on any of the guys that got hurt the last like six weeks. So like, you know, it's, it, it goes both ways, but when you're on like the, the bad swing of it where, you know, you feel like every week, the guy who, you know, Chris Hansen cuts to getting carted off at, you know, 1.30 on a Sunday afternoon. It's like, oh, yeah, I had him in 40% of my lineup. <laughs> um, you know, and then you get to, like, the end of the day and you're looking at, like, which lineups are, like, kind of in contention and have a chance. And you're like, oh, look, there's that guy that was carted off earlier. He's, he's on this roster that... Uh, that's like 15 points out of first. Would have been nice if his leg was in one piece. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, it's part of the game, but not a fun part. Um, yeah, but what, so what do you, you know, is that kind of the sum up your week? You, I know you mentioned injuries. Who were the guys you had last week that, that went down? I was off to such a great start. I had a two, well, everybody had two and Hill, of course, but I had a two, a Hill, a chain double stack. And obviously he wound up going off later on. And most was off to a good start too, or somewhat of a good start. Yeah. I had that, but I had a Brian Robinson run back for uh, the commanders. In this case, I had a run back on, on one of the, on one of my five for this tournament that we cover. And he started off great. And then, you know, just like that out, um, I had another team. I don't think we mentioned this off air, but uh, Ramondre Stevenson, I had some decent exposure to. He was off to a good start. He had like four rushes, 39 yards, two or three catches. And then he goes down. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, Tank Dell, broken leg, I, I believe from his own player, if I'm not mistaken, that landed on him. Well, uh, I had him with Hill. Strategically. Yeah, I mean, he's like he's like 5'9", 165, and they – they had him like lead blocking at the goal line, so that's probably probably a little bit of coaching malpractice there. Um, <laughs> and then our practice build, our very practice build last week, Kenny Pickett out, and he yeah. was. I know it was a weird game with delays and stuff, but he was peppering Pickens early in that game. I mean, Pickens was off to a great start, and then Pickett goes down, and that blows that up. So yeah, those are some of the notable. Oh, and also, um, I had a team. It was the Hill of Chain which was doing good with Tua. And I had um, Debo in the late window, but I had him skinny stacked with DeAndre Swift and Swift goes down and gets injured. Did Swift get hurt? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I saw, obviously he didn't do great. I but... for losing on the in-game injuries. I just, it, it, it's very disheartening. Uh, me and Stat ATL are actually uh, back and forth in our private message talking about it. It's just, it's brutal, man. But um, especially when, like you said, uh, I want to get on that streak that you make mention of where, man, six or four weeks from now, I could say nobody got injured at the end of the year. I hope to be able to say that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I want to quick uh, go through and share. So last week I kind of rolled up the stakes on FanDuel. I played in the uh, the monster, the $555 tournament. Um and that tournament is uh, it's four hundred thousand dollar prize pool. There's seven hundred and eighty eight uh, players. Um, first place is one hundred thousand dollars. So I took sixty uh, third out of seven eighty eight. Um, my lineup was, as you can see here, Jalen Hurts uh, with AJ Brown and Debo Samuel from that game. Uh, and then I also had Jamison Williams and Brevin Jordan as. Uh, some cheaper, um, you know, salary relief guys. Uh, and then I had the Rams defense, which was pretty popular. And then my uh, running back and flex guys were Jalen Warren, Devon Achan, and or Achan and um, Bijan. So, um, you know, a couple interesting things here. Uh, smaller tournament, very similar, a little bit bigger than uh, the tournament you play in most weeks, um, but similar. It's you know more than like 200 people and less than a thousand. So kind of in that same range as far as strategy goes and stuff. Um, interesting things here. Uh, so number one, um, going into the late window, I had had five players play and I was just under 60 points, right around 60 or just under 60 points. Um, and so I had the Rams defense and then the Hertz Brown Debo uh, game stack. Um, so like the cash line at that point was at like 85 points. And obviously that's going to go up um, from there. I think it ended up at 121 um, in this tournament. Um, <clears throat> but then it's like doing some math, like what's it going to take for me to cash, but also trying to think, because I think the lead at that point was only like 130 or something. So it's like, okay, like, is there a chance that I can, win this thing so you know the the easiest like change swap would have been uh to swap aj brown and debo to brandon Ayuk and uh Devante smith 
um, which Smith did ended up doing better than Brown. Um, but obviously Debo smashed Ayuk there. Um, so it was, you know, both of Ayuk and Devante ended up, um, I think they were like 10 to 12% in this tournament. Um, and, you know, ownership projections, that's right around where they were projected. And so as I'm making that decision, it's like, I ended up sticking with what I thought was the more optimal one, which what I thought was the higher upside one, even if because of the ownership percentages, um, if that hit like it did, I, I wasn't going to be able to win, um, which was the case and which was fine. I ended up, like I said, I took 63rd place. Uh, the entry was 555. Uh, I won $1,200. Um, so a little over 2x my entry. Um, the more, I guess, painful part of this is as I was building this, because I only put one entry in this tournament. So as I was building this lineup, um, I was pretty set on most of it. Um, the spots I was unsure of. So you'll notice I did not play Zach Moss, super chalk Zach Moss, um, who I really didn't play much of at all on FanDuel. Uh, I played a decent amount of him on DraftKings just because his price there was so low. And um, it's just hard. It's, it's easier to get the points there, I guess, like to get a couple cheap receptions and stuff. And um, he was so close to the min price and it's harder pricing there. So um, played a little bit more of him there. Uh, still was way underweight the field. I played like 25% Moss, I think. Um, but on FanDuel, I didn't play much at all. And I didn't have him in this tournament. So it was a matter of, um, you know, I, I had a Chan who I definitely wanted to play um with the dolphins i wanted to have at least one dolphin basically on every roster um but then you have jalen warren and Bijan robinson so since i wasn't playing moss uh you know the other thought i was pretty much equally high on Bijan and derrick henry um who were both projected for single digit ownership uh Bijan was 8100 henry was 8200 um so there was that and then uh, Jalen Warren, who I was really high on um, in a great matchup at home. Um, you know, you talked about the the picket stack last week, like the Steelers, if picket stays healthy, I think they probably score in the twenties. Um, you know, but Warren was, he was projected and, you know, about where he ended up like 20 to 25% ownership. So um you know, I had thoughts of, do I swap to James Conner, you know, on the opposite side of that game? So it's kind of like max leverage off uh, Warren and Moss if I went with Conner and uh, Derrick Henry. Obviously, I did not make that swap. Um, if I had, I would have won the tournament. Uh, you know, Henry, I think, had like 18 more points than Warren and Bijan had, or Henry had like 12 or 13 more points than Bijan and uh Connor had like 15, 16 more points than uh, Warren. So, yeah, a uh, little disappointing there um, that I guess I wasn't uh, fearless enough. Um, but you could have gone the you could have gone the James Connor revenge narrative train for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Derrick Henry, did you see the shot he took in the fourth quarter? Yeah, I saw. And the then allegedly, he's not even in the concussion protocol. I don't believe it. Like, it's funny because, like, after the game, Schefter tweeted out, like, he's at Derrick Henry's in the concussion protocol. And then Monday, Vrabel was like, no, nah, he's not in the concussion protocol. It's like, what? Like, <laughs> I know he's a big man, but, like, his brain is the same size as everyone else. Yeah. Uh, yeah and there's been, like, all sorts of rumors in the offseason that he's been dealing with, like, brain issues, like, con like the you know, repeated trauma type stuff. Um, I can believe it. So yeah, he. I mean, he's safe. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, um, that practice build from last week, we are thinking similar, sir. The, I switched, so I had Pickett, Pickens, and Fryermuth. I actually switched out to Warren, so I actually had Pickett, Warren, and Pickens okay. on my team in the in that tournament, and I switched to Brevin Jordan because, to your point, I don't think for Fanduel, definitely for DraftKings. Zach Moss wasn't the key to unlock. Brevin Jordan was the key to unlocking 
value, I, f- I felt, last week. And he happened to have a decent game. But 4,300 as a starting tight end on a Stroud-led offense. You know, that I had I had Brevin Jordan on him. I, I switched basically my tight end spot to Brevin Jordan on every team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also faded Moss. I had Moss on one, maybe two of the five teams. I definitely was underweight on Moss as well. I actually did the Henry Titans defense for – my Moss leverage against him team. You know what's funny though? The guy who took down first place, let me get your thoughts on this real quick. In the tournament that we're about to cover again, that we've been doing all year, the guy who took first place, and I would never think to do this ever, but maybe I should start thinking this far outside the box, or maybe he just got lucky. He had Derrick Henry and the Colts defense. Who, and they both did good. You know, Henry had his 24 points, fan duel points. The Colts defense had 18. So he got exposure is what I'm trying to think of how he did it through the Colts in a way that nobody else was going to be on. But it seems to be theory-wise, it doesn't seem to go. Like you're going to play the running back against the opposing defense. It seems like that's bad. So I think, I I think in like a larger field tournament, like a lotto type tournament, like – that's like way too thin it's way too thin for both of those spots to hit like a ceiling for you to win it but i think in your tournament where there's like under 500 people um i would say the thought process is probably this he's not playing moss and he wants to leverage he wants to get the leverage off moss so he's thinking what are the ways that could happen? And like but he already achieved that with Henry. What's that? He already achieved it by Ross. Yeah, but him. it could have happened without Henry hitting. Henry could have had a down game. Like, like there's two ways Moss fails, basically. Like the Colts defense, like because people like the running back defense correlation, but that's also a lot of times a defense having a big game. Like if a defense takes, if a defense has a pick six or two pick sixes or like whatever, like that takes possessions away from the offense. So then the other team's on the field more. So like, I get what you're saying. Like they're both like Henry and the Colts defense weren't both going to hit their ceilings. That's why you wouldn't play them together like that in a, lottery style tournament but when like what was the winning score in your tournament like 150 i think it was uh 156 yeah so i mean you know that's less than 3x so you look at the two of them together he's basically i mean he's basically taking it as i mean kind of how it played out like wasn't that far off like the the titans um you know, road Henry and Will Levis still made enough mistakes and whatever the Colts made enough plays to, I mean, how, how did the Colts end up scoring? I didn't play their defense at all. So I don't even know how they. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, I'm actually looking at it now. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. The winning team was 158 points. That was close. 158.76. Yeah. So yeah, they had uh, six stacks. They had a defensive touchdown. So they scored 18 points, right? Yeah, they scored 18. Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's like the the defensive touchdown, like I said, that's an extra. Obviously, the Colts, like the Colts won in overtime, what was it, 31-25 or something, 28-25? Right. Um, I wasn't really But I mean, if you think play. about it, if you just take away one touchdown from each team, a uh, 31 28 was the final. It was 25 25 at the end. Um, so, I mean, that game could have easily been like 20 to 17. Colts win with a defensive touchdown, and Henry has both the Titans touchdowns. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to go about it. Like I said, it's it's basically just it's a lower ceiling way to try to get leverage off Moss, I guess. It's not how I would do it, but like I'm just trying to think through the thought process of like. Yeah, I am too. I thought it was very interesting. I mean, I, at, at first glance, I was like, 
this guy's just throwing crap up against the wall. But no, I mean, you know, it's a lot of industry people play in this tournament. So I'm sure there was a method to that madness that I didn't even like stuff like that is what I need to at least broadly account for maybe in uh, roster construction, you know, even going forward. And that's why, like what JM always says, look at the winning rosters, how they were constructed, try to break them down to what they, how they were thinking when they did it. Cause that's definitely an angle that I, I wouldn't have thought of like on the face of it. So. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's not always going to work out, but also like you didn't need to be like perfect. Um, yeah. And I think it's, because they were like around 4,000 and Henry was 8,200. They were a little, I think it was like a combined 12,000. So, um, I mean, you know, basically if from those two, if you can get 35 points, you're, if you get 30 points, you're in pretty good shape in your size tournament. Um, and I think honestly, like, like I said, it's not how I would think about it, but that's not like a, like in hindsight, if you're betting against Moss, that's not a bad bet that Henry plus the Henry and the Colts D are going to get to uh, 30 points in that game. He may have very well been thinking, I know nobody else is going to do this. And and if he's making five teams, I kind of get it maybe from that. And he, he would have been right, obviously. And, and for this, for that week. We'll have to ask him. Yeah, right. Um, this dude, so, you know, yeah. I've seen him in the tournament before. Go I'm gonna pull up uh I'm gonna pull up the tournament for you and you can go through your roster again for those watching. Uh Max is Maximus his tournament. Steve is Maximus's real name, by the way. Uh, but his tournament's a little bit smaller this week. It's a five entry max, twenty thousand dollar uh total prize pool, only 349 entries this week. The payout structure is really good. It's uh, 25% of the field again uh, this week, eight, top 84 positions. So uh, bigger, uh, more places are paid percentage-wise for this tournament, and it's about 2x your buy-in that you're getting for a min cash. So uh, structure-wise, it's really good. 4K to first, 2K to second. So 4 to one top three. So it's um, fairly balanced at the top payouts. So structure-wise, really good. That's why we encourage this. It's a five-entry max, uh, so you don't have to worry about people playing 150 lineups. A um, little bit smaller this week because uh, getting close to the end of the season, and uh, did it not fill last week, Max? It did. It did? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm guessing, I'm guessing the biggest factor is because they have their FanDuel Championship this week, which is a $250 entry. Um, and so they're kind of just proactively, uh, they've shrunk a few of their other tournaments, like the $55, the bomb, um, usually is a 400 K this week, it's 250 K I'm guessing they just shrunk a lot of those to try to, um, to anticipate for less people playing those as their money is allocated to the big tournament, uh, but also to try to probably push, um, some people, uh, that direction. With that said, we'll let you take us through your lineup. Yeah. What I do like about it is it's less entries, but they went back to 25% and they went back to the that max first place payout that it that it was at the start of the year. Um, I have to say, I think it's one of amazingly one of my favorite practice builds of the year. So I'll try to take time but consolidate at the same time going through it. So Basically, there's five positions that are the one o'clock games, and then there's four positions on this team that are for late game slash, uh, spla <laughs> I can't talk, slash late swap purposes. And like you mentioned earlier, obviously you have the marquee or what could be the marquee game again in the four o'clock window with the Bills and the Chiefs. So we start with, of all people, Jake Browning, the dawning of the age of Aquarius could be. <laughs> Could this be the dawning of the age of Jake Browning? Uh, he's at home. This is going to be his, I think, fourth or third full start now. Uh, this guy's been balling, man. Like he he has he went 354 for a passing touchdown. He rushed 22 yards on two attempts for a rushing touchdown, and he's had 
four three and two rushing attempts, a uh, four for forty in his first game, and that was probably he came in. I don't know if that was a full game even against Baltimore. Uh, it's, that's the game Burrow got hurt. It was right. wrist, wrist gate. So dare I say we have a dual threat, a poor man's dual threat quarterback for fan duel purposes at 6,500, great price. It kind of almost reminds me, not that he's as talented as this guy, of week one, the Anthony Richardson 6,700 price tag that, you know, a lot of people were playing and rightfully so. All right, we have to cut the stream off. You just compared Jake Fleming <laughs> to Anthony Richardson. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We'll see you next, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> All right. Drive safe, guys. Thanks for coming up. Um, so anyway, in this case, we do have Jake Browning. We have him paired with his man, Mr. Jamar Chase. Monster, 7,900. Are you kidding me on Jamar Chase? Come on, man. So I got Browning on a skinny stack with Chase. I'm bringing it back with the notorious Zach Moss, who everybody and their brother was on last week. I actually like Zach Moss's spot better this week. I'm assuming he'll probably have some ownership, but no way will it be like last week. And part of that will be recency bias. It'll be over, it'll be over 40%. You think so? Okay, that'll be interesting then. Well, we can get I, into that. Well, well, we'll get into that ownership talk, but it's all, I mean – projection systems and uh like the sims people that do the sims just that drives so much of what people do and he just you, you're not wrong he's i don't think he's a bad play but yeah he's he's still going to be owned at sub 7k well he was up to like 70 80 90 percent in my tournament i think he was which i loved when i saw it i think he was 90 percent owned in this tournament last week so there's no way he's going to reach that level. Part of that is just people have recency bias. If he didn't, oh, the, the guy who the guy who won my tournament, the the monster, the five hundred dollar, um, he had Moss. Moss was eighty seven point eight percent owned. Yeah, it's crazy. So I have Browning with Chase. Got the run back of Zach Moss there. Um, then we have, um, as far as the early players go. Um, we have um, Janu Smith at the tight end spot. Now, what I like about his price point is you do have other options around him at the same price. You could go to the other side of that ball with Kate Otten for the Bucks. And now, obviously, if we find out Dalton Schultz is not going to play again, Brevin Jordan is the exact same price. You could even go back to Brevin Jordan at 5000 there. I like Janu, though. I think he's due. He's been kind of quiet. The Bucks give up a lot of production to the tight end position, as do the Falcons on the other side of the ball, actually. Um, well, I guess three games ago he had a good game now that I'm looking at it. but uh, So I have him. And then the Browns' defense is just – I'm sure it's going to be mega chalk. Uh, Trevor Lawrence likely to not play. I even heard a report that the backup, C.J. Beathard, got injured in practice too. So, oh, my God, on that possibility. Browns are at home. They're a great defense anyway, even if Trevor was playing. I wouldn't like the matchup that he would have if he were. So that's basically the early shell is just the Browning, Jamar Chase, Zach Moss run back, John New Smith at tight end, and um, the uh, Cleveland Brown defense. So now we get to the uh, 4 o'clock portion of, the, of this particular build. James Cook I have at 6,600 there. This man has seen an average of 44 offensive opportunities target slash touch over the past two weeks. It seems like he is really finding a stride. Well, I, I, you said that wrong. Well, total opportunity. So okay. you said average. So I was like, no, nah, he'd be breaking some things if he was averaging 44. Well, he is with rushing attempts. No, and no, no. Hit, no, no. His average is 22. Two weeks. Oh, well, I said over the last two weeks. You said averaging 44 over the oh, last two weeks. Okay, yeah. That's why I was correcting you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. I, knew what you, I knew what you meant. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But, I mean, still, he is really being – they are really revving up his usage, it seems. I'm not really worried about the rest of that backfield. And they're going to need his skill set uh, going into Kansas City, I feel. And I love his price at 6600 uh, then we have another one, Devontae Adams, 7,400 all day. 
This man has not, now we will go averages on Devontae. He has not averaged less than seven targets except for one or two games the entire year. And he's had up to 13 targets, uh, I think, two times out of the last four weeks. It's just unbelievable the usage on this guy. And we know Aiden O'Connell loves to look for him early and often, pepper him with targets. Uh, just love his price at 7,400 there. And then we have, um, uh, so this is the thing in the flex spot. I want to make now, as I'm saying this, I apologize in advance to you, good sir. I hope the Grim Reaper doesn't show up because I'm making a point to mention prioritizing him. Christian CMC, McCaffrey. We bid you adieu. I'm sorry, man. I, I'm heavy on C-Mac this week. I don't care what his price is. The last meeting, I think he smashed anyway. He smashes every week, seemingly, as long as he's healthy. I think he smashed the Seahawks the last time. They played. Yeah, or close to. So I love C-Mac and the flex here. You got to account for him. I like that there's salary allocated if you want to swap, which we'll get into in a minute. But on this particular team, I got C-Mac and the flex. And then I have a run back of Jackson Smith and the Jigba. One thing I want to point out about his price at 5,500, if we go back to the screen, it's a dual purpose. It, it, it works theoretically in theory because it's a skinny stack with C-Mac. However, if we get news that Joshua Palmer is going to come back, he's the exact same price also in the late window at 5,500. So if people aren't catching on to that and he's very low owned, if you wanted to, you could probably pivot off the jig butt of Palmer uh, at the same price there if he comes back. We're not sure yet, of course. But I kind of thought about that when I saw that their prices were the same. Um, he's at home, you know, going up against Denver. I would imagine Sertan, the priority is going to be on Keenan there. But um, so that's the team as it is. However, four spots are late window. So I have three different combinations. If you don't want to play, Christian McCaffrey there, or maybe if you make two or three shells of this team, I'm seriously considering two of my five teams to be this exact one o'clock seven. Definitely going to have a Josh Allen core. Definitely going to have a Brock Purdy core. Keep in mind, guys, it's five teams we get to build in this contest. So the last two weeks, we've kind of been covering the more speculative end of the spectrum, if you will. So if you take out C-Mac, here's, and you take out James Cook, and you take out Devontae Adams, and you're left with that five core. You take out C-Mac. So obviously we have that early skinny stack bring back tight end defense. You could feasibly do Josh Jacobs, Debo Samuel, Jordan Addison, and then you can do Travis Kelsey in the flex spot, do a two tight end flex there. That's one combo you can do. I'll let you put it up real quick, and then I'll just cover two more, and I won't, don't want to be too long-winded about it. But yeah. make a long story short or a short story long, there's a lot you can do with the salary uh, if you're doing a 5-4 combo this week. If you believe you're going to need exposure to the Bills-Chiefs game or one of these other 4 o'clock games. I mean, the Raiders in Minnesota could be a sneaky potential game, too. Uh, Dobbs with Jefferson for the first time. It'll be interesting to see how those two connect or don't connect. So that was one combo, Jacobs, Debo, Addison, Kelsey. You can take them out. You can put in Alexander Madison and then pair him with Devontae Adams. And I love this combo. So you can put in Devont put back in Devontae. Gotcha. And then for your last two spots, you can get you can go Brandon Ayuk and Stefan Diggs. And that's a pretty sick four o'clock uh, swap of players. You got to keep track of, you know, how your one o'clock is going, the ownership, you know, what it's looking like. And then my last um, combo that you could switch to, we're going to get JJ in there, even though Jefferson at 9,000 just coming back. It's definitely, I, I consider kind of risky maybe, but you could go, uh, you can put James Cook, uh, Cook's back in. And then you can, you're exactly right, Justin Jefferson. Skinny stack him with Devontae Adams. <laughs> Amazing. 
And then in the flex spot, you can do a very unique skinny stack of James Cook and Isaiah Pacheco for the Chiefs in the flex. And that would work. Obviously, watch his injury status. I know he had something that popped up Wednesday. So these are different ways, guys. You can utilize late swap. I want to comment. I have a friend that I was uh, I didn't realize that he actually even does DFS or that he even played on FanDuel. It's a part-time gig that I have. And we started talking, and we were talking about this week. This is just two days ago. And I was telling him about this late swap thing. He goes, oh, really? I always heard about that. I never do that. I, I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, in a way, he's my friend, so I want to educate him. And on the other end, it's like music to my ears. How many people, maybe in this tournament a little more so, because there's a lot of industry people in it, either don't utilize late swap, are too lazy, don't think to, or don't know how to, maybe strategically. And so it, it's a big time weapon on a week like this on first glance uh, of doing practice builds. And I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Browning is obviously the guy I was referring to uh, at the start about, you know, kind of stars born on Monday night. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously cheap. Um, I don't think he's Anthony Richardson, but I do think, uh, you know, he's going to take off three or four times throughout the game. Um, the His receivers, his, his skill core around him is so dynamic that they draw a lot of attention. So when he does run, he's got a greater chance of success, right? Because, you know, there's just, he's not a guy that people are spying on, you know, where like a Lamar Jackson, like the defense is always, because he can rip off like an 80 yarder, they are more likely to be like focused on him. Whereas Browning is like, he's not athletic or fast enough to where like, they're not worried about that aspect of it. So it gives him kind of this like cheap, I, I say cheap, it, I guess it fits in multiple ways in one way, like his salary, but cheap, like he's going to get some cheap yards just because they're like, oh yeah, okay. He took off. We'll take that because we're trying to keep these other guys from getting loose. Um, I think that's for sure. Interesting. Um, I think especially in this size of tournament, one thing I would, uh, Think about is so like T Higgins is only 6,300, which is way down from uh, where he's been priced earlier this year. Um, last week on Monday night was his first game back. He missed uh, quite a bit of time, basically the whole month of uh, November almost. Um, but I think, you know, with Browning being somewhat cheap, him showing how, you know, being so good uh, last week on Monday night, um, you know, I think, especially in this size of tournament, I think the double stack, you think about like, rewind two years, how good Burrow double stacks were uh, with Burrow. and But then with Burrow, uh, Chase and Higgins or Burrow, Chase and Boyd or any of the two receivers, um, thinking about how good they were a couple of years ago, but then they became so high priced, right? That then it became like near impossible for the last like year and a half. Uh, to play those doubles just because they were priced so high. And it was rare that like one of Chase or Boyd was going to fail when Chase is like 8,800 or Chase and Higgins, I should say when Chase is 8,800 and Higgins is 7,500. Um, but with all of the uh, price tags suppressed, I think just something to consider. I, I don't dislike your build in any way, but just um, that was the kind of the first thing. Um, I thought of with that, um, you brought up the McCaffrey thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously he's a great play every week. I don't have any issues with him. The interesting thing with him. So like Hilo does his end around piece every week and he talks about restrictive chalk and expansive chalk. Um, and basically the idea is with like pricing, the more expensive a guy is, he restricts what you can do with the rest of your lineup. Um, you know, that's the high logo is much more in depth, but, you know, I bring it up with McCaffrey because like, yeah, he, he, at his price, he's never, not never, but he's rarely going to be like mega, like 30, 40% owned, um, at 10,500. But what he does is he kind of limits 
what the rest of your roster can look like. So like with your core there with McCaffrey, as you went through those other like groupings and stuff, um, like you could see all the different, there's a lot more options and um, you don't have to use quite as thin of plays, I guess I'll say at some of the other spots when you don't use him. Um, so it's just, it's just kind of interesting. Like you've either got to hit like the low priced guy who does have like scores, like a couple touchdowns or goes for a hundred yards and a touchdown. Um, you know, you, you kind of need that, um, especially in the bigger tournaments. I think in your size tournament, McCaffrey is a great play. Um, I don't know ownership wise, does he end up usually higher owned in your size tournament? Well, first I'd have him in the flex for sure, just in case. Yeah, I know. I just pulled him up there. Yeah. No, he, he, you know, he's usually kind of modest, uh, you know, not under owned, but definitely not any, anything close to what you would define as chalk ever. Yeah. Also just, uh, not trying to be the gotcha guy, but you actually, if you were going to use Ma, uh, McCaffrey and cook, you should have McCaffrey in the running back spot. Okay. Because Cook's, I mean, I'm just, I'm a just in case guy, and Cook's game actually starts 20 minutes after. Oh, you're saying you have a little more time on the 425 players. Yeah, I mean, stuff happens, right? Like, what if Cook pulls it? Yeah, you know, and you want to play a receiver, switch to, you know. But um, either way, I think, you know, just the idea that, so if McCaffrey is owned in 15, 20% of lineups, those lineups, the rest of the lineup is going to look a lot more similar than um, like a, like Zach Moss at 6,800 if he's 40% owned. The other eight spots have a lot more the different directions they can go with those spots. So um, just that combination of salary and ownership it's not just the ownership number, I guess, that that matters. Um, I, I'm not saying he's a bad play at all. I, I actually love the play, and I love it for this contest and for the way this week sets up. You know, how you built this team with um, – so you've got the five guys in the early window. So with those four spots that you've got left, by having McCaffrey in that initial build, it naturally gives you so many options if you want to swap around. Um, you can also see, like, if Moss at Moss is high ownership, you know, he if he goes for 25 points, but then you've got the Browning Chase um, combo and they have another huge game, um, you know, and, and then Janu, you know, he's had a couple big games. Like, if you're sitting really good, and you're in this size tournament, like yeah, take like just take C Max like 25 points, just like lock that in. Yeah. Um, but then his by allocating that salary to him, it gives you the options where, like, okay, like, well, I played Moss and he was 40, 50 percent owned, but like he kind of dudded, and like Chase and Browning did all right, but and John who flopped. Like, if you're in that spot where it's like, oh man, like I'm gonna have to do something like, well, then it's easy. You just swap off C-Mac and you play these four guys who like none of them probably are as good of a play as C CMC, right? But like, you know, some of those combos you had are like all guys who could have two touchdowns and it wouldn't surprise at all. You look at like Jordan Addison is a high upside guy. Travis Kelsey has kind of disappointed lately, but you know, if he scores three touchdowns on Sunday, nobody's going to be surprised. Um, so yeah, I just think that the, w the way this week sets up with four, uh, late game, four games in the late window, uh, you know, and some good offenses, some exciting spots to kind of give you options to swap around with. Um, I think CMC is like an outstanding play to start in your lineup. And then you can see where, where the chips are, um, you know, when you get to, the fourth quarter of the early games and, and kind of decide where you want to go from there. Yeah. My only retort to the T Higgins thing, you are correct that if it's a big, if you would double stack rounding, it would have to be Higgins probably because the tight ends in this case, we always talk about, or even in your course, 
the cheap tight end you can attach to your quarterback. You can't do that with the Bengals because they use three tight ends and they underutilize all three. So tight end's not an option. You could possibly go Mixon maybe because he is a pass catching running back. But hit, my thing with Higgins, and maybe it's a bias I need to get over, he's burned me. The in, I, I'm trying to give myself the best shot of not having in-game injuries. And man, T. Higgins is such a getting injured in the game candidate. I mean, the guy even didn't suit up in the last minute a few times. I mean, I think it was last year. So I, I have to get over maybe my bias of Higgins. I'm just not a – he's burned me so many times, and I understand you got to wash that away. But it just seems like Browning kind of – he's at a point right now where I don't know if his reads are capable enough to support two pass catchers. It almost seems like it feels better. He locks on to Chase or they're designing plays for him and Chase, it seems – at this stage of his development. That's my opinion. But I do see what you're saying from a theoretical standpoint. If you are going to double stack them, Higgins would be probably the the most likely uh, uh, that makes sense, logical other receiver if you wanted to do the double stack there. But uh, in this case, I have him as a single stack. I think Chase gets used so many ways. He can be used at the line of scrimmage. He can go deep. He can slot. Uh, he's just such a, a multifaceted receiver. Whereas Higgins is more of kind of like a compliment almost to him. And then also he's coming back from injury. And I just uh, I just cringe at the thought, two plays in the first quarter and he <laughs> something happens and he's out for the rest of the games. I, I, that was, I did think about Higgins. And I was like, uh, I don't know if I can get there yet. <laughs> I mean, my thought on it, I, I don't disagree with any of what you're saying. My thought on it is it's just like uh... – I mean, it's basically an arbitrage. It's like such a depressed value for that Cincinnati double stack. Um, like, it's just so much cheaper. Like, if you, I mean, Browning's not Burrow, but he's, I mean, he looked pretty good against the good Jaguars defense on Monday night. I was going to point that out too. A very respectable defense. He was, you know, doing really well. Go ahead. And, I guess my point is just like if you just blindly look at and this is I try to like zoom out and look at like macro like big picture type things like if somebody told you like hey you can get a Bengals double stack with 80% Joe Burrow you know for significant for what I mean Browning's 1500 cheaper than Burrow Chase is about a thousand cheaper than he used to be. Higgins is about a thousand. So, I mean, it's like $3,500 cheaper than, you know, what a Bengals double stack has been previously uh, against, I mean, the Colts defense is, I mean, they made Will Levis and the Titans look pretty good last week. I mean, they haven't been good all year. My, my thought is just like, just like from a blind, like perspective of like the Bengals, double stacks what that usually costs like i get what you're saying about like kind of the worry with higgins but also it's again the size of your tournament here like if chase I'm if browning has a good game i want to prioritize Devonte too though i gotta get what's that i really want to get at Devonte in on this uh particular team it was was also my thinking but but no well, i see what you're saying though yeah, and that's I guess that's kind of where I'm going to with it, where like with the McCaffrey um discussion is like I think he has a really good game, but also like if you don't play McCaffrey, um, you know, it's pretty easy to move up from JSN to Higgins. Um, you know, or even if you do play McCaffrey, you could still play Higgins. I mean, you could go like you you mentioned Mixon. I guess you could do that. He's only seventy two hundred and you're basically you could take basically you're going to have all the Bengals touchdowns accounted for in some way if they go for four touchdowns. Um, you, know, you could even play just Browning and mix in without Chase. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways you could go with it. I guess that's my whole point is just, um, you know, and again, going back to the size of your tournament, like if Chase, if Browning has a really good game and Chase just has like an OK, like a 15 point game, so he has 80 yards and a touchdown that probably means the next guy, which is probably Higgins 
ha- also had like 80 yards and a touchdown. So it kind of, it's like the Henry Colts defense um, discussion earlier um, where it's kind of like a floor thing uh, that maybe they both don't hit for like a monster ceiling. Um, but also like if Higgins goes out, <laughs> if, if your fear comes true and Higgins goes out in the second quarter, then your Chase Browning stack is smashing. Or mixing, yeah. I guess my other, well, two things. One is I kind of think there's already enough value just in the fact that Chase and somebody like Devontae Adams are so underpriced and Browning 6,500. So I don't really feel further value is needed to Higgins. I'd understand if, if I needed to open up value. But on the flip side, you actually made mention of something. And shout out to JM, guys. you got to listen to the Winner's Circles, this edition. I actually got to listen to this morning. A great uh, talk up on defenses by JM. How he kind of, his thought process with uh, narrowing down defenses for a particular week. But then he also goes over the uh, player blocks on certain teams and, you know, how many points are available, kind of like in a bucket. And, uh, you know, without, you know, he obviously goes longer and articulates about it more. But that, I don't know if you've listened to it yet or not. It's the Winner's Circle mm-hmm. podcast. But that kind of falls into what you're talking about with Higgins there, kind of like that bucket uh, where, you know, it's a very concentrated offense right now for the most part. You are correct. It's basically Chase, Mixon, and Higgins. I mean, he doesn't really throw to the tight ends. And Mixon is one of the very few, I guess you could say, bell cow running backs left where he gets most of the opportunities. So, yeah, from that point, well, that's right, Tyler Boyd. I almost forgot about him. He's involved still. But still relatively compared to other setups, there's a concentration there, so I can kind of see it from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, like I said, for me, it's just like a blind. Like I'll be running some Browning doubles. Like I'm gonna play. I'm gonna have at least one in the uh, that Fanduel. I'm gonna pull it up here. The oh, yeah. Fanduel Championship, um, two hundred fifty dollar entry. I'm gonna play like eight or ten entries in this. It's a million dollars to first, so I'll have at least one um, Browning double stack in there. Just because, like I said, it's just like a a blind, like, I'm going to play a Bengals double, like, at super, at super reduced price um, in a good matchup. Like, I'm just going to blindly do it, um, you know, and not really think twice about it just because, I mean, they can be, they can be so good. Um, I just think it's an interesting game, too. If you look at the one o'clock games. Obviously, Detroit and Chicago. I'm not sure what the weather's going to be outside of Chicago yet on that one. But in Atlanta, Tampa's in a dome, but they're common opponents. They know each other well. They know what each other wants to do. Jacksonville, Cleveland is kind of no Trevor Lawrence now. Cleveland's strong defense. You know, it's it's an attractive game in the early window in general, I feel. JM, a few weeks ago, even him and I had been talking about how the Colts just like they tend to just like spike yeah. these game environments. And you look at like their recent games. I mean, they, the Titans, 50, 59 points in a Titans game, 47 in the Bucks game. Then you've got, okay, the Patriots and Panthers who like arguably the two worst offenses in the league, like completely dysfunctional. So those games were not great, but then uh, 65 points in the Saints game, 77 points in the Browns game, 57 points in the Jags game. Um, you know, I mean, that's four of the last six weeks or five of the last seven weeks, I guess, um, 47 or more points, you know, with four of those weeks being uh, 57 or more points. Um, and you look at, I mean, the Bengals looked really good on Monday night. Um, so you just see how like those game environments um have tended to spike. And then like you talked about, you've got those buckets of points uh, for teams. And like, that could be a pretty big bucket that the Bengals are fishing out of. um, And a a relatively concentrated group that's doing the fishing. So um, yeah, there, that's a spot where like, in some way I'll probably be accounting for Bengals on every, um, on every roster. And it's interesting because, like, on FanDuel, it's early in the week, but, like, 
it doesn't look like anyone on their team, any individual player is going to be over 15% owned. So like, to me, like none of them are probably going to be completely overlooked, but um, like, I'll be surprised if at least one of Chase, Mix, and Higgins doesn't have like a tournament worthy score this week. And you, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what I was getting to, and you beat me to it, is the Colts seemingly are just part of these explosion games throughout the course of the year, and there's no reason based on this setup why you know how why it wouldn't happen again. It seems like Cincinnati is kind of on the come up, uh, getting used to Browning, and, and he's getting more comfortable, and then the Colts you know, still have a lot to play for, of course. So, For sure. Good stuff. I, we went longer than usual this week, but I think it was uh, a valuable week. I certainly uh, enjoyed the conversation. Kind of, I learned learned things as I'm like talking through it. So, um, like I said, I've got a big big week this week on FanDuel. That's basically where all my energy is right now, uh, building towards that uh, the FanDuel Championship. Um, you know, the Bengals. I'm high on. Interested in Josh Dobbs. Uh, who has five games scoring 23 or more FanDuel points this year, getting Justin Jefferson back. So those are kind of my two uh, cheaper quarterbacks that I'm interested in on FanDuel. Um, and then otherwise, uh, most of the rest of my builds are going to be around like the expensive, um, you know, the Allen Mahomes and that Buffalo KC game. And then uh, Lamar and Fields um, rushing quarterbacks who are right around 8K. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's kind of it for my quarterback player pool. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I've kind of crossed everybody else off and I'm just going to roll with it. What are the maximum amount of entries you can put in that contest? Is it a 150? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's going to be some high dollar activity sling in there. All right. So <laughs> if any of you watching, have $37,500 laying around, you can max the FanDuel championship. That is not financial advice. Do not do maybe, that. Maybe, maybe we can take the poker route if you guys want to buy some shares of us. <laughs> I can actually tell you if you're watching this, you probably, I I, I will give you financial advice. If you're watching this, you, you should not put 150 lineups in the... <laughs> I don't, I don't know how else to say that, but don't take that personally, anyone. But uh, yeah, do not put $37,000 in that tournament. Agreed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, hopefully next week I'm we're in here breaking down a couple winners. And uh, Absolutely. Hail to FanDuel this week. We're both going to be focused there. And, you know, we'll catch you on the uh, – I know we need to be better. I, I know I, on the uh, FanDuel tab – of the uh, OWS uh, Discord channel. I know usually most of the traffic is for DraftKings on the uh, Inner Circle chat and obviously the, the show on Saturday that, that Hilo and uh, and Xandermere do. But, you know, they all, I know Xandermere plays on FanDuel. I'm sure he'll be in it. He'll be in your tournament probably. So, Yeah, I would think he'll throw a couple in there. Um, I think that, uh, I yeah. I also think in our inner circle discord, people just need to be more vocal about um, uh, getting in the inner circle, not just in the, like the separate fan duel. We don't need to be outsiders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to post. I usually do fan duel parentheses mm -hmm. when I'm making comments. I've been fighting people about Josh Dobbs all year in the inner circle chat. I usually get attacked about Josh Dobbs. I'm like, look, you know, he's a, serviceable quarterback with rushing ability you know he, he's he's capable of popping off so to your point he's another really interesting quarterback to to consider this week yeah well we will see you all next week thank you for joining us thank you for sticking around if you did for this full hour of fan duel goodness i am mike he is maximus we will see you next week we will see you at the top of the leaderboards best of luck everybody Good night. One week season.